Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. In the last part of arrays, we will learn about arrays of objects. So far, we have looked at arrays of, for example, int. To recap, we have learned at how to declare and create an array of one-dimensional and also two-dimensional. We have looked at examples on how to use and read the rows and columns using nested for loop and also using the instance variable line. We have also learned about passing arrays to methods and having an array as the return type in the methods. Let's look back at this slide. Here we have an array of strings object called name list. As what we have learned in previous topic, we know that string is an object unlike int, double, char and other types that are primitive data types. This means when we create an array, we are creating an array of objects. What about string? String is an object. Creating an array of string, meaning an object of a string, is basically creating an array object that contains string objects. What does that really mean? So if we do system .print line and then the name of the array, it will give us some value, which is the reference to it. Let's look at this simple code to make sense of it. Here we have two arrays. The first array object is an int and the second array object is a string. Remember that string itself is also an object. What will be displayed when we do system.out.print line and then the name of the array for both primitive data type int and also the string object? It will give us some values which is the reference to the array of the int and string. If you run this code, you might get different values because these values refers to the address where the objects are stored in the memory. You can see that int array and string array have different addresses because they are different array objects. What do this output means? You can refer to the JVM specification to know more about it. From this output that we get, if you refer to the JVM specification, it will tell you that the square bracket over here that is highlighted in yellow it means that it is the reference to a one-dimensional array. i means that this is an integer, which is what this first output is, an array of int. The rest of it is the address where the integers are stored in the memory. ljava.lang.string is the instance of the string class, and the numbers after that is the address of the string objects stored in the memory. So going back to this slide, when we have array of strings object in the memory, the address of the string are kept where it then pointed to the real values, while in other primitive types, the values itself are kept in the memory and can be accessed directly. To recap about it again, see that we have this code, string, string array equal to new string 5, so the size of it is 5, and at index 0, we create an object of string to have the value hello. Then, we create another object of string at index 1 to also have the value hello. What do you think will be displayed on the screen if we run this code? So we have here if string array at index 0 equal to string array at index 1. Does it display same or not the same? It will display not the same because it compares the addresses of the string objects. What if we do string array 0 equal to hello, so the value straight away, and then string array 1 equal to hello? Will it display same or not the same when we run the code? It will display same because string has this concept of string pool, where it looks for string with the same value in the string pool, and if it found it, it returns the same reference, otherwise it creates a new string in the pool. So, to be safe, whether you are creating a new object of a string or using the existing reference in the string pool, instead of using the equal sign, use the equals method when comparing two strings. It doesn't matter if you created several string objects or not. Using the equals method, it will compare the values of the strings instead of the addresses. In Java, in addition to creating arrays of primitive data types, int, double, float, and char, we can declare arrays of objects 
as shown in the previous slide when we have the example of arrays of int and arrays of string objects. An array of primitive data is a powerful tool, but an array of objects is even more powerful. The use of an array of objects allows us to model the application more cleanly and logically. For example, we can have an array from any user-defined classes. String is a predefined class. By combining the power of arrays and objects, we can structure programs in a clean, logical manner. Without an array of objects, to represent a collection of user-defined objects, we need to use several different arrays. For example, if we have a class called account, we might have to create several objects, one for names, one for addresses, and so forth. This is very cumbersome and error-prone. So how to declare an object of array? Let's look at how we normally would write our code. Say that we have a class called person and person test. In person class, we have three private instance variables called string name, int age, and char gender. We have two constructors where the first constructor has three parameters called string name, int age, and char gender. As the variables have the same name as the instance variables, we need to use this keyword to differentiate them. So, this dot name refers to the instance variable. All the instance variable will have the value of whatever the user passed in when the constructor is called. The other constructor is the no argument constructor. It basically initializes the instance variables as no name, zero, and dash. In person test class, we have the main method. It basically creates the object of the person class and calls the constructors, then display the values. When we run this code, the output that we will get is as shown here, where for person P1 and P2, they call the first constructor, and P3 calls the second constructor. Since we did not learn about toString method previously, I'd like to introduce it here, as it makes writing code much simpler. In Java, toString method allows the object itself to be written. This means it can return the string representation of the object. We need to override the method, otherwise it will display the address. For example here, we can do system.out.println object which is p1, p2 and p3. It will display the addresses for all the objects. When we override the method toString, for example here, we want it to display name, age and gender. So those sentences will be displayed. Keep note that the method header for toString is string to string, meaning that it will return a string. To call toString method, there are two ways of doing it. We can invoke it as what we have learned before, which is by using the dot operator and the name of the method. For example here, p1.toString. If we write it as p1.toString, what is the difference of having a method called anything else, right? For example, p1.displayOutput or other methods that we can define. We don't have to use toString method. So, the main advantage of using toString method is we can write the object name itself where it will automatically refer to the toString method. For example, when we write system.out.println p2 and system.out.println p3, it will refer to the toString method and displays the output. We do not have to explicitly use the dot operator and refer to the method. You might want to take advantage of this useful method in Java. But remember that if you want to use toString method, you need to override it, otherwise it will display the address of it. Going back to object array, how to declare an object of array? We saw that from the previous slide, we have three objects and we created them separately where we call the object as p1, p2 and p3. All three objects refer to the person class. What if we have 100% object? We do not want to write p1, p2, p3 up until p100, so we can use array. 
The concept is the same as when we first learn about array. We can create an array of a person's object. We write it as person, person, so we call our array as person, equal to new person and the size of our array. For example here, the size is 3. Here we are just declaring it and say that we want to have a person array size 3. We haven't created the person object yet. This new here refers to the object of the array, not the object of person. This slide here is showing similar thing of what happened when we declare an object array for the class person. At person, person, we only declare the array called person. No array is allocated yet. When we write person equal to new person 20, an array size 20 is created. So we can store 20 person. As I mentioned previously, we haven't created the object of person yet. We only created the array object. When we write person at index 0 equal to new person, here we are creating a person object. It calls the no argument constructor called person. Because this is an object of person, in the memory, it will have the reference or address of the object. To create an object for all person, we can use for loop and each of them will have their own references. Here you can see that if we do not use array, then we have to create our object manually. For example, person A equal to new person, person B equal to new person, and so on. Going back to the example code that we saw earlier, here we have an array called person and the size of it is 3. We can create the object for each person by using for loop or we can do it this way as well. Here I want to show that for the person array, we can create the object of person that calls different constructors. This is valid. We have person 0 and person at index 2 call the first constructor. Person at index 1 calls the no argument constructor. We can have this in for loop and use if else where necessary to create the person object to call different constructors. To display the output, we can use for loop and it will go through all index number in the array. Here we just write person i and it will invoke the two string method. Let's look at another example. We have a class called rectangle that has three private instance variable called int length, width, and area. It has one constructor called rectangle as it has the same name as the class name and it has two parameters called int l and int w. Within the constructor, we pass the value of l and w to the instance variable. In this rectangle class, it has two methods called calculate area that has the return type void and get area that returns an int. We have another class called test rectangle and it has the main method. In test rectangle, we have an array of rectangle and the array size is 2. So we write rectangle rec equal to new rectangle and the size 2. The rectangle object is created in the for loop where it calls the constructor and pass in two arguments of length and width. As the size of the array is 2, this for loop is repeated twice for when g or the index is equal to 0 and when the index is 1. Next, it calls the calculate area method and calculate the area. Within the system.out.println, it invokes the get area method and display the result. The output when we run this code is shown here, where it asks the user for the length and width and it displays the calculated area of the rectangle. Let's look at another example. Here we have a class called person. It has three private instance variables called string name, int age, and char gender. It has one constructor that has three parameters called new name, new age, and new gender. The instance variable will have the values of new name, new age, and new gender. It has three setters or mutators methods called set name, set age, and set gender. It also has three getters or accessors methods called get name, get age, and get gender, which will return the values accordingly. 
Do you still remember why we need to have setters and getters methods? Because the instance variables are private, we cannot access name, age, and gender directly from another class. We can, however, access and modify the values through the constructor or the public methods of the setters and getters. If we do not have setters and getters, we have to create a new object each time we want to have new values for name, age, and gender. By using setters, we can reassign and modify the values of name, age, and gender of the existing objects. To access the values of the private, we will invoke the getters methods. Here we have a class called PersonList that creates an array of person class. We can declare the array as an instance of the class as highlighted here. We have a no argument constructor where it creates an object of the array and invoke the person constructor. From the previous code, we saw that person constructor takes in three arguments, string new name, int new age, and char new gender. In the add record method, we want to reassign other values to name each and gender. So here we call the setters methods and pass the new values. To display the values from person class, we invoke the getters or accesses methods in display record method. We cannot access the instance variables name, age and gender directly in the person class because they are private. That's why we access them through the getters which are public methods. In the main method, we create an object of person list class called list1 and it calls the constructor. As mentioned before, in the person list constructor, an object of person array is created and it invokes the person class constructor. In the main method as well, add record and display record methods are invoked. When we run this code, the output that we get is name equal to abu age equal to 21, gender equal to m. This is because we have reassigned the value using setters, even though in the beginning, when we create the person object, we call the constructor and pass in an empty string, zero and a dash. Similar as other examples, we can use for loop to prompt the user for input for the name, age and gender, and then using for loop again to display the output. Try and run the code and see if you get the same output if you enter name, age and gender as Ali, 18 and M. You can also change the size of the array where here I put the size of it as 1. So that's why it only asks for one name, age and gender. Another example, find the youngest and oldest person. See that we have an array of two person. Similar code as before, in the add record method, it has a for loop that prompts the user to enter name, age, and gender. It then creates an object of person at each index. At the compare each method, we see that each at index 0 is the youngest age. We go through the for loop to check the value of each at each index and we use if statement to compare the values. See here that the variable youngest refers to the index number, not the value itself. That's why we wrote person youngest.getH to get the value of H at the index youngest. We can use the value itself instead of the index number as well. Using the index number might be better rather than using the value itself because if we look here, within our system.out.print, we want to display the name and age of the person. If we use age value instead of the index number, we have to do another if else to match the age and also the name. Another way that we can do this is by using two dimensional array instead of two of one dimensional array. Let's see this example where we use two dimensional array. So we have private person P equal to new person so the row is 2, the size of the columns is 3. Here we have the nested for loops where the outer for loop 
goes through the rows and the inner for loop goes through the columns for each of the rows. Assume that we have decided to keep the name at column 0 and age at column 1 and also gender at column 2. The arrangement is the same at each row as shown in the table here. So, in the compare each method, we only want to compare the each columns at every row, which is at column 1. When we run this code and enter Ali 19 and M and also Ahmad 25 and M, it will display youngest name Ali age 19 as the output. From this one-dimensional and two-dimensional arrays, it should be clear by now how we can use them to represent the same data. How to delete an object in an array? As we have fixed the size of the array, we cannot make it larger or smaller on the go. We cannot resize our array dynamically. This is the same as what we have seen in array part 3. As mentioned before, we can delete it and resize it if we are using array list. Array list is a resizable array, also called as a dynamic array. You can try and learn it by yourself if you are interested to see how array list works. By using the basic array, in this approach, we simply leave the position of a deleted object to a null, meaning that we are leaving it empty. With this approach, an array index positions will be a mixture of null and real pointers. For example here, we have person at the deleted index equal to null. Another approach that we can do is, instead of having a null value in the middle of the array, we can shift the references of the others to replace the null index value. This means if we have an array of size 4, only the last index, which is index 3, will be null. In the previous example, when we delete at index 1, only the element at index 1 has the value null. In this example here, we change the elements in index 3 to replace the value at index 1. Normally, we would shift it by 1, meaning that index 0 still has the value A, index 1 will have the value C, index 2 will have the value D, and index 3 will be null, so that the values are still in the same order. To do this, we would write person delete index equal to person delete index plus 1, meaning that it takes the next index element value to the previous one. Deleting an array using null. For example, in this code here, we have two objects of persons at index 0 and 1. In add record method, it sets person at index 1 to null. So, as index 1 has null value, Perhaps in other methods that would access the index that has been deleted, we can write an if statement such that if the value is not null, it will proceed and access all the values. The example is highlighted here where it is written as if person at index i not equal to null, it will display the name, age and gender. Try and run this code to make sense of it. If you look over here in the beginning, we say that person at index 0 would have the value Ali, 18 and M. Person at index 1 would have the value Ahmad, 20 and M. And then within the main method, we call the add record method. And within the add record, we say that person at index 1 becomes null, meaning that we are deleting it. So if you run this code, it will display Ali, 18 and M as the final output. So far, we have seen examples of one-dimensional and two-dimensional array. If requires, we can define three-dimensional or n-dimensional arrays, which can be any number. The syntax to declare and instantiate the array is similar to what we have already known. But with an addition number of dimensional, we need another square brackets to represent it. For example, in three-dimensional array, if we look at it as a graph, we will get the x, y, and z axis. We will write it as data type, first square bracket, second square bracket, and third square bracket, and then the array name, equal to new data type, and then the first square bracket, 
would represent the x-axis, second square bracket represent the y-axis, and the third square bracket represent the z-axis. To access it is also similar as before, where we can access the x, y, and z for three-dimensional array. If you want to have n-dimensional array, then you would have more to represent each of the dimension. For example, for the three-dimensional array, if we have double car dealers equal to new double, 10, 5, and 7, where 10 is the rows, 5 is the columns, and 7 is the other axis, we can use nested for loops to access each axis of it accordingly. For three-dimensional arrays, we would need three nested for loops. For four-dimensional arrays, we would need four nested for loops. The figures here shows the difference of one, two, and three-dimensional arrays in terms of the axis, rows, and columns. That's all about arrays. In this last part, we have covered about array of objects. We have seen several examples of creating an array of string and also array of the user-defined objects. We have also covered on how we can delete an object in the array. And finally, we quickly looked at multidimensional arrays.